Now welcome to another lightning response video where this time the question comes to us from Zeke Kraft who asked, Hey Thor, can you explain in more detail what you found interesting about Balin? You mentioned that he somewhat stole the show, but I just don't understand what anyone sees in him. As far as I can tell, he's a generic bad guy who showed up out of nowhere to do bad guy things for reasons. We know he used to be a Jedi, we know he expects to find power you can't imagine, and he wants to end the cycle. Or in other words, generic bad guy goals without any specifics. Where was he during the Clone Wars? Where was he during the Rebellion? What is his actual goal? We know little to nothing. I feel like people must be filling in the blanks with cool fan theories, but this guy is practically Snoke in my book. Help me understand why he's interesting. Well, first and foremost, I think it's the charisma and performance of Ray Stevenson that has drawn in a lot of people or made them kind of immediately just interested in the character. Every so often, an actor just kind of has this certain something about them that makes them perfect for a particular role, more so than just being a talented actor. There's just something that fits or clicks for them that makes it seem easy or natural to slide right into the character. Just to look at a Robert Downey Jr. as Iron Man, for example, it was almost like he was born to play that character. You can't imagine anyone else doing anywhere near as well or playing the character. Even a Chris Evans as Captain America or a Chris Helmsworth as Thor, they're in that same sort of league. I think a big, big reason for the success of the early MCU was damn near perfect casting. Same goes for Star Wars back in the day, the original film, with the likes of Harrison Ford as Han Solo. Can you imagine anyone else playing that character? Or a Carrie Fisher as Leia. That was, again, perfect casting. Even Peter Cushing as Grand Moff Tarkin. I mean, in all reality, he's about as generic in terms of story as a bad guy will ever get. But he nails the part and feels like one cold-blooded evil bastard, doesn't he? And I think in more recent times for Star Wars, Giancarlo Esposito was another great, great choice that Star Wars made or Lucasfilm and Disney made. He plays a fantastic villain in pretty much everything he ever does. Again, there's just something about him, a gravitas, a charm, an evil air that he can somehow naturally give off, despite being a pretty nice guy in real life from everything I've ever seen. But people instantly liked his character, or liked him as a bad guy. And almost ironically in that case, the more we got to learn about Gideon and his plan, the less people tended to like him, because the writing very much failed the performance in that case. By making him a guy just trying to make force-sensitive clones of himself, he turned out to be uninteresting and kind of dumb. Sam kind of went for Snoke, who you bring up. I know we now look back at him and laugh, but there were plenty of fans interested in the possibilities with him, back in the days of The Force Awakens, I mean. And for the little bit of time we got with him or from him in the films, I think Andy Serkis, he delivered. I think in another reality, one where they actually had a uh, Snoke theory and delivered on it, people would have or could have come to really like and enjoy that character. There was certainly potential there, and it wasn't all just people filling in the blanks for him with theories either. Same now goes for Balin. I don't think the excitement around him is just the theories about what he's looking for, though it is part of it because what he's looking for seems new and different, or seemed new and different till it turned out to be Mortis or the Mortis gods, though why exactly he's looking for them is still unknown and mysterious and could be very interesting. And that's because the unknown almost always tends to be more intriguing than the known, which is also part of the reason I and others like him. He is indeed a brand new character with an open-ended beginning and end for us to explore. Unlike a lot of other characters in the show, pretty much all of them outside of Morgan Elsbeth who dies, he too in theory could actually be killed at almost any point. And I almost thought he would die in that final episode when Ahsoka encountered him again and after having lost to him before, or in the fourth episode, because she of course had sort of powered up since then by going through all she did in the world between worlds with Anakin, and then even watching some old Anakin training videos while practicing. I thought for sure she was going to win round two because they showed us all of that, using a training montage to imply getting strong now is one of the oldest tricks in the book. And so yeah, the not knowing everything about him is one of the things that's allured people to him, and if they don't end up paying off, if they end up dropping the ball with this character, people will end up not caring or being very disappointed. Just like I'd argue many ended up disappointed with the aforementioned Gideon or Snoke. But in the case of Gideon, he was very similar to Balin now, or he was in the first two seasons. We knew he wanted Grogu's blood and he had the Darksaber, and that mixed well with an amazing performance from the actor and had us loving to hate him as, again, a new Star Wars villain. 
You then also ask some questions about where was he during the Clone Wars or the original trilogy or Time of Rebellion, and those are indeed really good questions, but they're not flaws with the character just because they haven't been answered yet. Which isn't to say that perhaps we couldn't have gotten a bit more from him or his history in this show. I think there were certainly plenty of opportunities to dig into his past quite a bit more than what we got. But it's not like introducing him here and now creates any kind of holes in the previous parts of the story, which you maybe kind of imply here, or maybe you're not and I'm just kind of reading it wrong. But I mean, there were roughly some 10,000 Jedi during the time of the prequels and going into the Clone Wars then. That's a lot of stories left untold. Stories that may not have, shall we say, made front page news because they didn't do something that impacted or related to in all reality, the little bits and pieces we've seen in the shows and movies, we don't actually see a lot of what happens during the Clone Wars, just the small parts they've showed us. So it's not like they got close to covering every single thing of importance for the time period for every single character. Same with him during the original trilogy. I mean, it sounds like he was just kind of going around doing bounty hunter things, more or less, since the fall of the Jedi. Though I'd almost think he still would have been a target for Darth Vader and the Inquisitors. He is a former Jedi, whether he wants to admit that or acknowledge that or carry that on or not. But just because we haven't heard about that yet, we haven't heard Vader hunting him or an encounter with Vader, that doesn't mean there wasn't room for it to have happened. In the grand scheme of things, that's a smaller or less significant story, but that doesn't mean it can't simply fit and be interesting as well. One example I like to bring up whenever I see or hear anyone say something like, but where were they during this part of the story? Why have we never heard of them before? Which I hear a lot in relation to Ahsoka. And I'm not saying, again, that's necessarily what you're pointing out or your problem is here, but look at Mon Mothma, for example. She just shows up in the third movie of the original trilogy. She just shows up as the leader of the entire rebellion in the final movie without anyone having mentioned her before. So how is that even possible? Why didn't we see her at Yavin or Hoth? Well, for one, and of course, the real answer or obvious answer is George Lucas just hadn't come up with the idea for the character yet. But for another one, even if you are someone important, very important as the leader of the rebellion, it's not like everybody just talks about you all the time, right? It's not like everyone mentions you with every chance they get. Just because, say, Balin never shows up in a Clone Wars episode, for example, and no one ever says his name, that doesn't mean he wasn't there the whole time doing who knows what. Again, I'm not saying that's what you were even implying, that's just an issue I see brought up all the time. And again, especially with Ahsoka. Why is she not in Revenge of the Sith? I hear that one all the time. Why does Anakin not even mention her name? And again, yeah, she hasn't been created yet, right? When Revenge of the Sith was made, George Lucas hadn't thought of her yet. But at what point was he even supposed to bring her up? Was he supposed to say at the beginning of the film, this is where the fun begins, or it would if only Ahsoka were here? Anyway, to sum it up, why I like Balin and why I think others do as well, it's a combination of performance and possibilities. And he stole the show because I was more interested in learning more about him or following his story than I was the story of the titular character because it seemed to have more potential. It was more open-ended. I've talked a lot about there being no tension in the show, and that's because I never feared anything truly bad would happen to Ahsoka, Sabine, Ezra, Hera, or any of the other ones like that. Plus, we kind of figured they would lose to Thrawn in the end, that he would get back to the other galaxy somehow. We kind of just knew that was going to happen. But with Balin, who the hell knew what was going to happen with him? He could have done anything from die at the end of Ahsoka's lightsaber to find something that would shake the foundation of the very galaxy, or the other galaxy. And that was interesting, especially again because of the performance of Ray Stevenson. And now we're kind of left wondering what happens next with the character after the very, very unfortunate passing of Ray Stevenson which sure may have played a small part in why people liked him. I think they wanted to like him given what had happened, that this was his final performance. But I don't think that was the reason. I think the guy gave an incredible performance and there was some solid writing behind him actually. Not perfect, but solid enough to really get people intrigued to want more. And that's why Balin Skull worked. Well, that's all I got for you this time. Now it's your turn to take to the comments below and tell me what you think about this one. Why did you like, or maybe not like, Balin Skull? Or you can always ask a question for a future lightning response video. Just start your comment off with Hey Thor and then fire away. Whatever you choose to do, leave a comment below and let's talk some Star Wars. And until next time, thanks for watching.